Hi, I'm Tamara Munzner, and I will be talking to you about visualization analysis and design. Let's start with chapter one. What's visualization and why do it? So my current favorite definition of visualization, which I'll call viz for short, is that computer-based visualization systems provide visual representations of data sets designed to help people carry out tasks more effectively. So why is this an interesting definition? Let's unpack some of the words inside of this. So first of all, notice how we've got data and people in the same sentence. So why do we want to have a human in the loop? Well, visualization is suitable when there's a need to augment the capabilities of a human rather than simply replacing people with purely computational decision-making methods. So we don't need visualization when a fully automatic solution A exists and B is trusted, but there's many situations where that's not true. For example, many analysis problems are really ill-specified. We don't know exactly what question to ask in advance. Sure, we could maybe write an algorithm or a program or run a machine learning approach to answer a particular question, but what if there's 100 questions? What if there's 10,000 possible questions? That's often the situation we're in. There are many, many branching paths that we might ask. So there's a lot of possibilities for human in the loop visual data analysis. Um, it could be a long-term goal where you know that people will continue doing this uh, basically indefinitely. This is the common case with exploratory visual data analysis, for example, of scientific data. And that's a major use case, but there's others as well. It could be that you're not trying to explore the unknown, you're trying to explain the known, you're trying to present known results. This is very common in situations like data journalism, uh, for example, New York Times, The Upshot, The Guardian, many other newspapers uh, are doing a lot of that today. And it's not just for newspapers, it's also with people that are trying to present a report about what they've discovered to somebody else in a finance situation, when teaching, all kinds of reasons. Now, there's other cases as well. It could be that you are trying to develop an automatic solution and you're not there yet. Maybe it's a stepping stone towards something that is more automatic or at least more supported by some automation. So you might not even have a model yet. You might need to understand more before you could even develop a model. Maybe you've got a model and you started to have some sort of computation around it, but you need to actually figure out how to do that. Often a visualization might be trying to work itself out of a job. It's directly aimed not at eventual end users, but at algorithm or model developers to help them refine uh, some sort of computational solution, determine parameters. Um, and it could be you've already got a fully automatic solution, but you have to keep an eye on it. Either you're trying to decide whether it's realistic to deploy it or post-deployment, maybe you're trying to monitor it and really have some sort of human judgment involved, even if it's not uh, down in the tightest part of that loop. So you might need to build trust or continue to have trust in a fully automatic solution. These are all situations in which we might want a human in the loop of doing data analysis. So why a visual representation? Well, that's actually part of a more general class of things that we call external representations, a term out of uh, cognitive science, where we're really emphasizing that there's two different places things could happen, inside your head and anything outside of that that's scaffolded by some sort of additional material, whether that's pencil and paper or a computer screen. And so the idea is with visualization, we're trying whenever possible to replace cognitive acts with perceptual acts in order to free up cognition for more interesting, typically higher level questions than the really low level ones. Say I show you a table full of numbers, right? Here's one, this happens to be gene expression levels uh, measured by biologists. And you know, there's a lot of numbers here. And now if I tell you that our goal is to try to understand some sort of overall structure here, well, that's hard. And it's not because we're unable to read numbers, we are. But to read a number, remember it. Read the next number, remember that. Read the next number, remember that, and compare it to those other two. Pretty soon we run out of essentially short-term slots of storage in our head to do that. So if you want to get some sense of, well, what is the overall trend? This is not that many numbers, you know, several dozen. But it's actually a cognitive act that's quite demanding. Whereas if we visually encode it, here we're replacing the cognition with perception. We've actually taken all those numbers. We've even added more information about the relationships between genes that were known from liter the literature. And we're encoding those numbers that we saw before with, in this case, a diverging sequential scale 
And the result is that we're able to read off patterns quickly. Here, for example, we see on top is uh, four time points, and on the bottom is also the same four time points, but on something where a uh, experimental condition was imposed on uh, that set of genes, like you know, giving a, uh, an example of a drug. Now, the thing to notice is the top two, they have roughly the same proportion of red, uh, meaning down-regulated to green, meaning up-regulated, and the second one too. And then at the fourth one, we really see a difference. There's more green on top, there's more red on the bottom. And then finally, in that last time point, they're roughly the same again. And that tells us that this experimental, con experimental condition actually did something. And the point is we didn't need cognition to do that. We could do that directly with our eyes and our visual perception system. And then we're able to free up our mental resources for thinking about higher level questions. In this case, about you know what are some biological reasons that that might've happened. But why vision? We do have other sensory modalities after all. Um, and the answer to why visualization depends so much on vision is that the human visual system is an extraordinarily high bandwidth channel into our heads. And what's really great about it is that we have evolved to do an enormous amount of essentially background processing, to use a computer metaphor, which makes us think we see everything around us all simultaneously. Now, it turns out we don't actually. It turns out you see a tiny little bit at once and your brain goes back behind the scenes and knits together these tiny little pieces. These are called saccades with foveal vision uh, where your eyes are darting around, but you don't have to think about that. That is done without the need for conscious attention. So it seems to you like you actually see around you. Now in contrast, something like sound it could have been that we would experience the sound the same way, but we don't. We experience sound sequentially. Fundamentally, when we listen to a song, it is a thing that is elapsed over time. Yes, you can hear multiple notes at once with chords or with multiple instruments, but you perceive sound sequentially, whereas you do perceive vision uh, as this experience, this subjective experience of simultaneity. And that is a really important capability of getting an overview of things that is completely crucial for a lot of how we use visualization. What about some of the other sensory modalities? Well, touch and haptics. Um, right now, we don't have very good ability to record or replay. There are some solutions that allow you to sort of simulate the experience of maybe having something pushed back on your finger pointing, but nothing like the complex dexterity uh, that we have in any sort of physical uh, real life haptic experience. And then of course, taste and smell are not yet really viable for recording and replaying uh, aside from some pretty exotic uh, research situations. So we do have really great technology for both recording visual uh, phenomena, our cameras, and displaying it, our screens, you're presumably seeing it on a, a screen or a projected surface right now. So the technology for that is just uh, extremely advanced compared to the other modalities. Okay, why represent all the data? Well, it turns out that one of the great utilities of visualization is to help you see not just summarized information, but more rich detail. Um, summaries are crucial. We will be talking quite a bit about them, um, but they do dis of necessity lose information. And so visualization can help you both confirm what you expect to see and find something unexpected. Maybe you have a statistical model which is able to summarize data, but you wanna check is the data that's actually underlying an appropriate match for the model. Um, a great example is Anscombe's Quartet. Uh, these are a series of four data sets that were um, designed by a statistician Anscombe in the 70s to have identical uh, simple descriptive statistical uh, descriptors, right? Their mean and their variance in both X and Y and their correlation, they're identical. But the instant you plot them, you start to see some dramatic differences, right? The one on the top left sort of feels like you might expect something to feel, you know, a little bit of um, distribution. We see that we kind of believe that regression line. And then the one on the top right, obviously it's not linear, right? There's this nonlinear curve. We see this immediately. So it could be that, you know, an assumption of linearity is, is not wise for this kind of a data set. Um, and then on the bottom right, well, we've got something where that line is not quite tilted, right? Just because of that one outlier dragging it off. And of course, I love the lower right one where we've got something pessimal, where we've got these um, diagonal and then this outlier over here, and it makes the line be completely misleading. Of course, this was hand designed as a synthetic example, but actually it only gets worse. This is under 50 points. 
what if you have, you know, 10,000 points? What if you have complex heterogeneous data sets that's not just a simple table? What if you've got, you know, combinations of tables and networks and spatial data? What if it's all dynamically streaming in and changing over time? So we really often have needs to try to see some of the rich complexity underneath any kind of summarization or statistical aggregation. So what are the resource limitations we have to worry about here? Visualization designers really must take into account three quite different kinds of resource limitations, computers and humans and displays. So for those of you with a computational background, of course, we know about computation limits. How much time does something take to compute? So, you know, and how much memory does it take? So CPU time, you know, system memory, those are known constraints in a computer science context. But we can't stop there. We also have to think a lot about the limits of a display. So pixels are extremely precious in visualization, and they're actually the most constrained resource out there. And so where we often uh, directly hit the wall is we run out of pixels to display what we want to do. And a lot of uh, what we, I talk about in the book is to try to sort of help you through the thorny complexity of what happens when you run out of pixels. What are some strategies to try to uh, deal with the fact that you often have more display than you could see in a single screen. So I'll use the idea of information density where we think about the ratio between the space you're actively using to visually encode information versus all of the white space that is unused. And uh, what we wanna really do is think about this trade-off, you know, too much clutter is bad, uh, wasting space is bad, and how do you find that sweet spot between density and sparsity that allows you to communicate what you want while still actually seeing things in enough detail. Uh, so we'll talk about a lot uh, of that as we go on. And then of course, there's the limits of humans. Um, computers are getting faster still. Uh, displays are improving. The human visual system and brain, that's the part that's not gonna change, right? So how long does it take a person to do something? How much can we remember in our heads? How long can we focus and attend on something? These are very stringent limits. So visualization analysis is analysis and design is built on the idea that, well, we get benefit from analyzing. And well, why do I argue that it's useful to analyze? And I think of it as a way to impose structure on what's really a huge design space, set of possibilities uh, that you have as the designer of a visualization. So it gives us sort of a scaffolding to hang our thoughts on. And so the idea is that if we analyze existing visualizations, that's a great stepping stone for designing new ones. And that's what I'll be focusing on. Now, the reason this is worth doing at all is if you just try particular combinations of task and data, sadly enough, most possibilities of how to visually encode and interact with that data are not going to be effective. So we don't just wanna take a random walk through the parameter space, we really benefit from being able to guide our search. So let me just give you one example. I'm not gonna talk about the whole analysis framework in this intro video, but I just wanna give you a flavor for how that works. So, Here's two systems, and they're both for visualizing really large trees. In this case, it's trees of ancestral relationships between species. Uh, one space tree is from Maryland, the other tree juxtaposer was out of my own lab. Now, if you just look at these, you can say, well, they're, they're different. Yeah, I see different pixels on the screen, but that's not very helpful. We wanna understand ways in which they're similar and ways in which they're different. So let's think about, well, what are we seeing? In this case, we're seeing tree data. Um, Let's posit why we're looking at this data. And the answer is that what we want to do is actually find for some given leaf node in the tree, what's the path up to the ancestor. Um, and so uh, in this case, the path from the, the leaf up to the root. Now, how do we do this? Well, in space tree on the left, we have this idea that we are visually encoding the information. There's some ability to navigate. This tree actually has um, hundreds of thousands of, of leaves and nodes. It's a huge tree, but we're only looking at a specific subset of it. Um, in fact, what the user's done is they've selected a particular thing of interest, in this case, um, underneath uh, for people. Um, and then the visualization system is automatically, based on that selection, chosen to filter out certain parts of it and not show them at all and aggregate other parts. Those are those little, um, uh, triangle shaped, showing you where an entire subtree, a very large one, has been completely collapsed and giving you a little visual indication uh, that there is something that has been aggregated there. 
okay, so what's different in the other one on the right? Well, similar all the way through, we're still visually encoding and there's still some concept of navigation through and selection. But in this case, when um, Homo sapiens is picked, then it rearranges the tree with this so-called stretch and squish navigation to make certain parts bigger and other parts more compressed in order to allow you to see that path up towards the root. So the point here is simply that now we're able to have some vocabulary, some language for talking about the similarities and differences between two particular kinds of visualization. So that's the end of the snippet and I hope you'll join me for more.